All right, welcome back to the Biblos Network. We are so glad that you have taken the time to join in with us today and talk about the great things of the Word of God. Praise the Lord to all the bibliophiles, to all the theophili, the lovers of God, the lovers of the Word of God. We're delighted that you're here and we're trusting that God is pouring out His grace and His blessing where you are. It is a great day to be apostolic. I'm going to champion that from the rooftops. There's great things happening here in Durham. I know there's great things happening where you are. And I pray that you, your churches, your pastors, the ministry there, that you're flourishing and thriving. And the blessing of the Lord is at work in your life. <clears throat> we've had a lot going on here in Durham. Um, you know, we've come through Easter. We've had uh, some great special guests. My son was just married. We just had a great gala and celebration here just, just yesterday. And we are just having a great time. The Lord has been good. And I, I said it in the wedding ceremony. I'll say it to you today here at Biblos. There is nothing better than living for God. Nothing. Nothing better. It is the blessed life. I'm so thankful. And a um, lot to talk about today. There's something special that we want to do here today at Biblos. We, we've received your comments. We've received your suggestions and all your questions. Please keep sending those in. Uh, we love to talk about those things. I've got some questions that are uh, ruminating in the background, and we'll get to those here in the next few sessions. We've got some great guests coming up, and um, if you haven't already, go by the merchandise section and grab yourself a Biblo smug and a, and a hoodie, a sweatshirt, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and give it to your friends and your family, and, and you'll support the mission here at Biblos. But today, I have the great honor and privilege of having a friend of mine here with us at Biblos. He was in town, and we were able to squeeze in some time before he gets back home. He's got a busy, busy schedule. But with us today, we have the Reverend Dr. Robbie Mitchell. God bless you, Brother Mitchell. Good to be here. Thank you for the opportunity. I look forward to the time we can spend together. Yeah, welcome to Biblos. This is awesome. I yeah. appreciate this. And I'm looking <laughs> forward to where this conversation will take us. Well, we've had some great conversations and um, many, many more to come, I'm sure. But um, we have some common ground here. You know, first of all, for those of you that don't uh, know Pastor Mitchell, he pastors a great church in the Denver metro area. You started that church 12 years ago last week. 12 years ago last So you just came through your 12 year yes. anniversary. Yes. And Denver, yeah, the church is, is growing. Great. God has been good to us. Yeah. Yeah. Denver's, um, Denver's a tough nut to crack. It is. It's the West. Yeah. It's the gateway, I guess, to the West. So the mindset is somewhat different, but uh, God has been good to us and we have nothing but uh, thanks. Yeah. or what he has done. Well, not only are we going to talk about some things that you've done academically and as an author, but uh, one of the things that we have in common is you're a church planner. Yes. You've planted uh, multiple churches. We have three churches, and uh, each one was unique in its own right, but God uh, somehow gave us the, the wisdom and grace to navigate those times. Church planting is not for the faint of heart. No, it isn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I planted one. I started another one, but it was kind of a segue to it with another uh, congregation. We had to uh, kind of start over in another location. Um, it is not an easy thing. No, what you have in you will come out. I mean. When you start a church. And I believe you'll be confronted on every part of your character your disposition, yeah. your life in general. Yeah. And uh, it will be exposed through the process. Well, one of the things that that, that uh, is, is in common here, not only that both of you, both myself and yourself have done this, but your father-in-law, which is the bishop here in Durham, Bishop Johnny Godair, this is your father-in-law. Yes. He is a veteran church planter. He and, is. And so there's this whole dynamic here that is just uh, native to the soil that we're growing out of absolutely and his wisdom through the years helped us to face the unknown mm -hmm. and uh, gave us the confidence and oftentimes the direction in how to go forward in the process yeah he's the godfather of 
North Carolina and the region and uh, in many ways, he helped found churches and start churches, either himself personally or financially or through counsel and influence. Yes. yes. He casts a long shadow yes. in this part of the world. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. Well, I love that. And we've had a, an opportunity to, to get to know one another and to get closer over the last couple of years. Uh, due to our relationship, you and your wife and your daughters have been a great blessing to us here in Durham, and we're thankful for your friendship. You guys have been a help in transitioning here. Well, thank you very much. I I believe our, like you've said, our friendship really began to grow through this transition over the last four years. Last four years, yeah. And uh, I don't know anyone that stepped into a <laughs> new pastorate the week that the world shut down. <laughs> you should write a book. I, <laughs> the week the world I, shut down. You know, all my friends are comedians, you know. <laughs> and so I come here and a week after I come here, COVID hits and the, the world stops. And all of them, or several of them have told me, Nathan, when you go to a church, it's supposed to explode with revival. Right. <laughs> the world's not no. supposed to stop. <laughs> I have this uh, <laughs> mental picture of you in the bucket of a lift truck yeah. on the parking lot <laughs> preaching in your new assignment. Yeah. I, I often wonder what was going through your mind at that moment. You know what? It seemed like a good idea <laughs> at the time. You know, we're, they're telling us we can't meet inside and, and Durham is a, it's a, it's a blue city. Um, it's, it's, um, they have a lot, they had a lot of COVID dynamics where they really pushed that narrative really hard. And so here we are, we're having outside church parking lot services and where are we going to have it? You know, the, the way the parking lots are, you know how it is, sure. they're kind of tiered and then there's buildings, you know, set. It's not like there's one big parking no. lot. So if we put it here, people can't see it. If you put it there, these people are. So we thought, well, what, what, we got a lot of daredevils. How high church. can we get? <laughs> <laughs> we, we can get where everybody can see us. When you see him go. <laughs> Well, it was it was a lot of fun. I held my breath a lot. While oh, I, was I imagine. There. But yeah. Um, but this is not our first time that we've connected. Another area that you and I have in common is we believe in education. Right. Um, you're not just a pastor. You're not just a church planner or author. You are a doctor. You pursued post grad work, and in the apostolic world, sometime in the past, education has been looked on with suspicion. It has even been. Um, you know, kind of pushed to the side in some arenas saying, you know, it's bad. Education is not good. You don't need education. Just, you know, love God, serve God. And, um, but, but now in 2024, the hour is demanding so much of us as ministers and as Christians. And we have learned some things and you have learned some things. And so you, uh, one thing I have noticed is that we have been able to parse out the, the difference between education and secularism. Yes. And I think that's what got people in the past is people couldn't, you know, they went to uh, liberal professors that would were, were trying to subjugate them and undermine their yes. faith. But now we, we have to articulate this message and we have to lead with intention and strategy. And so you are doing that. You're at the, the vanguard of that. And so you're, you're fighting for it. It was something that I desired to do throughout my life, just looking back from my high school days. Um, in those days, the push was on for our churches to start their own schools, and many of those schools were falling under the ACE program. Yeah. So, Ace, Ace Virtue. Yes, Virtue. and I, I went from public school to now high school and I'm thrust into a neighboring church, a pastor, not far from where my father pastored, their church school, and it was in a Sunday school classroom. Yeah. And it was under the ACE program. Yeah. And so after spending high school there, graduating, I often look back on that experience and for all the good that was there, I felt like I may have been lacking. Mm -hmm. Now, if that was a truth or not, I'm not certain. It's just the way I interpreted 
the education that I received the last few years mm -hmm. of uh, schooling. So I always had a desire at some point to go back, went to Bible college, and once again, once again, in our dynamic and paradigm, something that was small, out of the way from the view and limelight of the world. Mm -hmm. And I left that graduate time after graduating there feeling like I did not get everything that I wanted or needed because of that dynamic. Yeah. So I always felt somewhat lacking. And so through life, I looked for opportunities to continue yeah. to grow, to learn, to know, to gain knowledge for really more than, than self promotion to understand the world, understand people relate in a way that what I had to say or what I offered could in some way draw them to truth. Yes. And ended up years later, the internet, I mean, when, when I graduated high school, we learned to type on a typewriter. Yeah. <laughs> we didn't have computers. Yeah. When I, you know, went back to, for the master's degree, it was all online. Yeah. And uh, this it was, was a different a, world. A trip, man. And I had yeah. to try to catch up. <laughs> well, we did some master stuff together. Yes, we did. So, uh, uh, Wilson through Hope International University. And um, I think it was, you know, guys like Brother Libby and Brother McLaughlin and yes. good guys that were very excellent academics that yes. have gone on to do great things. Interesting that uh, Brother McLaughlin with the North Texas Christian College now, I, I'm an adjunct professor there. Okay. And he and I graduated together at AST Yeah. at that time, yeah. which was in connection with Hope. And then years later, he and I graduated from Liberty together with our doctorate. So that is, you got your doctorate at Liberty. At Liberty. Okay. Yes. Now that was kind of a circuitous uh, route as well. You know, you 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 had some some forays into it, and then life circumstances yes. you had to deal with because you're you're planting a church. Right in the middle of planting a church. Yeah, just grab a doctorate while I'm out here. I was in I was in the <laughs> process of the masters, and so I did not want to drop out when we. We're launching the church, so I yeah. stayed with it, finished that, and went straight into the process of regent, mm -hmm. regent. And after being accepted there, six, eight month process, realized my two older daughters, they were leaving to go off to college yeah. at the same time I was starting and I needed, I could not juggle it all. It's a it's an octopus. It was, it was too much. Yeah. So I backed out of Regent, their DSL program at that time, and then years later, when life afforded the opportunity, I came back around and went through Liberty. Okay, and uh, graduated there. Well, it's a great blessing, and it's opened up a lot of doors. It's a needed thing in this hour. You know, I, I want to talk about a couple things, but one thing I wanted to just touch on here. Pentecost, by virtue of its of its intrinsic qualities of you know lively worship and emotional outpouring, speaking with other tongues, um, preaching in the manner and style that we do, uh, there have been people that have tried to characterize it and and classify it as emotionalism, um, maybe superstitious, maybe from the other side of the tracks, and. Um, just not educated. Right. And so there's actually a kind of a two-prong thing. You've had people in Pentecost that have been leery of education because they've sent kids off to university. They'll send kids off to uni the university and they'll be indoctrinated with very secular ideologies. And then on the other side, you've got people looking in that have never experienced Pentecost and they immediately think, okay, this is crazy stuff. What is this? You know, this, they, these men are drunk. Right. <laughs> it's the, uh, well, now we find that there is a profound undercurrent to this that is very powerful and academic ability and the ability to dig things out 
is showing the theological underpinnings. I love this hour. Oh, yes. Because we have tools now to dig things out that are more uh, richly textured, more beautiful, and the apostolic message is flourishing because people have the courage to dive into it deeply. And that's one of our missions here at Biblos is to help people dive into the depths of the Word of God. Um, But but you're helping with that. And have you found that to be something that you've, you've been able to really get your hands on now that you're, you're, you've gone into this educational dynamic. Are you seeing that you're able to help bridge that gap between Pentecostalism and education? I believe so. And through the, the process of the doctorate, I was in contact with other denominations and involved with online discussions and Mm -hmm. zoom meetings on a weekly basis with pastors from other beliefs and never in that entire process was there ever a division as far as something combative Mm -hmm. there's a there's an openness in the world that we know nothing of until we, if I can say it and, and, and people understand the spirit that I'm saying this in, until we earn the right to be there. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's like a discussion, and I read this early on in writing. It's a discussion that you're coming into a room full of scholars that have been talking about things for centuries and you're new to the conversation. Mm -hmm. The last thing you want to do is come in and immediately interject your thoughts and feelings. This is where the crossing of swords often happens, Mm -hmm. is we assume no one understands or no one has considered or no one has thought. Yes, yes. But this conversation has been going on for centuries. Come into the room read the room, listen to the conversation, read the room, that's see something. the direction that it's going, and then look for opportunities to give your mm-hmm. thought. Now, the surprising thing is your thought may not be new to them. Yeah. And that's what will shock you is we think that we're bringing something that's just never been considered before. That's not the truth. It's just, it most likely is never, they've never heard it from someone who has experienced it. Yes. So even back to one of the original things you were talking about, why beyond just a personal desire to be educated, why did I continue this? It segues back to the church planting. I was planting in an area, and I knew I was going to an area that was highly educated, Mm -hmm. and many of the individuals or a high percentage of the individuals had – Uh, advanced degrees Mm -hmm. graduate degrees and for me to have a conversation more than anything I wanted them to understand I had earned a right to be at that table to be at that table yeah to have that conversation it's not that to to say that you are better than someone but expand grow I don't want to use 10 percent of what God gave me I I mean when we talk about being good stewards then then be a good steward of your mind. Be a good steward, not just of your body yeah. and of your spirit, but of your mind. Steward that to the full extent that God gave you the ability to do that. Will you answer for that one day? Mm. Perhaps. Mm-hmm. A- and I think that for Pentecost in general, it seemed to be a rule religion yeah. for so long. Yeah. And then we set back in our rule condition and say, why aren't there cities being reached? Yeah. Well, one of the reasons is people are not following the path and the avenues necessary to get to that. Isn't that, that's a good point. That's a, that's a very good point. To follow those routes and to, to make your way to the city and to qualify yourself to speak to the people that are there. It's not like some people have not considered this, but maybe it's not experiential, number one. And you know, we do ourselves a disservice when we don't enter into that arena because you leave that wide open to third party. Absolutely. You got somebody who's never experienced it defining you. Absolutely. Paul, 
when we when we read the life of Paul and the ministry of Paul, one of the things we often refer to is where he sat, where he learned at the feet of Gamaliel. Mm -hmm. But did that was was that a big part of his life in most of what we read about? No. The what mattered that he said at the feet of Gamaliel was at the end of his life mm. when he was at in the presence of had he not said at the feet of Gamaliel, he would not have been able yeah. to address. He would have been end. out of his depth. He would have been out of his yeah. element, but he was effective in that. So who, who is this guy? He sat at the feet of Gamaliel. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So Gamaliel is a neat, I love the name. You know what it means? The camel of God. Wow. The Gamel mm -hmm. is the camel and the L suffix is God, the camel of God. And in that culture, the camel is like the semi-truck. It's the, it's the symbol of commerce. So the Silk Road that went from Asia into the Middle East, the camel was the mode of transport. And the idea, yes. that, that's the whole camel going through the eye of the needle. Right. Um, uh, it, it's uh, Rebecca watering the servants of Abraham's camels. All of that has to do with the exchange. The exchange of ideas and products and services. And literally, you'll remember that when when people were talking about um, whether they're gonna embrace the gospel and there's this discussion going on, on, on among the Sanhedrin, Gamaliel says, take heed what you do. Right. There's an openness yes. to Gamaliel that comes through in Paul later on. Um, and, and, and more prominently, in places where others would not have yes. held up well. Yeah. Their yeah. mental fortitude, their convictions would not have held up in the pressure had he not experienced the grueling task of learning yeah. and, and putting yourself in a place to do that. And that transport idea, that, that exchange idea that comes forth even from his, the etym etymology of his name, Paul becomes the camel of the gospel. He, yes. He's taking it everywhere. You know, you read about, I, I, it struck me one time, I'm, I'm reading Galatians, and I, was, I, I went down a rabbit hole with Galatians and Galatia. And, and I love etymology, so I'm always going to explore the etymological foundations sure. of, a, of a name. And the name of that is Gaul. And it's the Gauls that we actually okay. formed Gallic France, which, you know, Charles de Gaulle Airport, I would, you know, right. Paris, you realize there's a French, a franco gallic connection between the Galatians and wow. the seeds of the gospel are planted by this, if you'll allow the metaphor, the camel that brings this, this exchange of ideas. This gospel has these openings, these opportunities that. And if we're getting there and, and if we were, if we are to be prepared when we get there, then it's what we do when no one. Yeah is is watching and sometimes that's the papers and the assignments and the discussions and the yeah the qualifications the, putting putting that responsibility forefront in our lives for the opportunities that may await us well it's critical and we you and i could probably spend the next two hours talking about yes. that but yes. there's something i really do want to okay. get to um you a, a part of what you have learned and have put into practicum is um is the is the concept of transitioning in relationships and in particular in leadership yes and so you've authored a couple of books and i want to talk a little bit about that okay um, because you you've written one recently but you have a previous book as well i want to talk a little bit about that um Transitioning. Tell okay. me, tell me how you get in transitioning, and tell us about your books. Well, the first book I wrote was in 2016, and it was dealing with transitions in general, Tra transition life, life's unavoidable reality. Mm -hmm. Everyone faces transition, but transition is something that no one talks about. Everyone faces it, but no one talks about it. And we're expected to navigate that with success, but we have no clue hmm. 
how to do that, how to get through relationships, vocational changes, spiritual growth. And we live under the assumption that you'll just get it right. You'll just get it right. You, so you hope <laughs> you hope. And it, the thing about it is if you do not transition successfully, then you're sidelined or you're sidetracked or you're delayed and you never get to your destiny. You never, people talk about destiny and mm. purpose. Well, transition plays a big part of that because tra transition is all about change. Mm. And if you're not changing, you can't get to your destiny. You can't get to your purpose, but then it, a step back is how do I get through this change? How do I address this change? What, what will success look like in this change? So I wrote the book and, um, at the, the point toward the end of the book is that ultimately we're working on spiritual change and there will be a day that we're changed in a moment mm. and the ultimate transition. the ultimate transition wow. is what it is. Wow, and so, good. so I, I feel like that every other transition in our relationships and our careers and, and though for thus for in our education, whatever it may be, every decision we make is leading us toward that one. If we get all of the other ones wrong, how are we ever going wow. to get that one right? Wow. So God gives us all of these opportunities to learn, to adjust, mm -hmm. to, to have foresight, to get, because that one is the one that matters. That's the one we're headed to. That's the one wow. that we're headed to. So the book was about that. And, um, interesting, Lee enough, as soon as I released it, within a couple of months, my father fell sick, ill, and he died in eight weeks, nine weeks, unexpectedly. Wow. wow. And so I then had to live what you preached. what I what yeah. I wrote. Yeah. That the transitions of family and and yeah. others. So 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 I know your second book you dealt with pastoral transition. Yes. But your first book is kind of a general touch yes. uh, into life and everyone relationships yeah, family. Rela yes yeah i think it would it would serve anyone and everyone well to read it consider the principles that are anybody there. anybody that's going from one place to another place yes would in their jobs in their family with their their loved ones with illness with uh what they want in their career and even their spiritual life yeah so it's a it's a it will appeal and it appeals to a general population absolutely now before we launch into the second part you have a website yes what is it robert mitchell two the number two robert mitchell two dot com and we can go there go there and we can get both of these books. both of these books now the first book is kind of a general uh dealing with the idea of transition but the second one is specifically for ministry yes it anyone can read it it'll give you it will give you uh the, this is the book this is the book the second book. The truth about succeeding in ministry transitions. What yes. every minister and churchgoer facing change needs to know. Boy, that's good. So it's it's uh, pulling back the curtain on what <laughs> what's happening behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. And we don't often want to talk about that. But we're forced to live the reality of it, but we don't want to talk about it. Well, you say... You know, you can if you don't handle it right or you're unprepared for it, you can be uh, sidetracked. You can yes. be, but some people flame out. They do. Some some churches just go up in flames. Churches, they they lose their momentum. Yeah, they lose years of effective uh, evangelism. Discipleship is no longer present. Yeah, because they're embroiled in this transition that no one considered how to get through. Yeah. And instead of effectively doing what God called them to do, they're face, facing inwardly and yeah. just dealing with all of the turmoil. And this can drag on for years. My, my, my. Uh, so going from the general idea of transition in your first book, which if you're a saint, if you are a, a seeker of knowledge, then um, go to robertmitchell2.com or you can just go to Amazon. It's on Amazon. And get it that way. It's called Transition, Life's Unavoidable Reality. Okay. It's a white and green neon uh, okay. cover. Well, so, but from that general concept, you then move into a ministerial application, which is what the second book is all about. Yes. And that one really, really catches my attention because obviously I'm a minister. Sure. I have, I've been through um, 
a couple transitions in my life. I've learned some things, but I will tell you, you and your wife have been an integral part of helping myself and my family transition here in Durham. Well, thank you. Because there's a there's a lot of moving parts. There's that a lot just, of moving parts. They don't know. You don't realize what's going on in the background. And no. uh, there's people. There's generational gaps. There's there's the hour you're living in. There's uh, styles of leadership. There's, Absolutely. Oh, there's a thousand things to navigate. Yes. So I wanted you to take a little bit of time and just hit some high points that okay. that you deal with. Because I know people are dealing with this. There's people oh. watching this right now. You're go, you're you're pulling your hair out, trying to figure out what you're going to do. Um, uh, tell us about yes. it. Yes. So how it came about was I feel like I could have, if, if, if I were to do it over again, I would have most likely broke that first book down into several parts and wrote individual books about each. One book about relationships, one book about vocation, one book, but it didn't happen that way. So I came back around and said, well, I'm going to write one book that deals with what my life seems to be marked by. Mm. And my life seems to have been marked by transitions in ministry because my father was in ministry and from the time i was a child we moved from texas to ohio and he pastored in ohio and then we went from ohio back to texas and we were in texas in one location and then we moved to a different location and then it was off to bible college and then from bible college it was 10 years as an evangelist full-time and Every few days, you're in a different church, a different community, a different culture, a different leadership style. So you're transitioning for 10 years trying to adjust. And then it's to church planting, and church planting is is, is its own animal. Ah. And then it's 10 years of church planting. And then from there to a an established 40-year history church with one pastor, legacy church to follow that <laughs> pastor. And, and You got a PhD before you got it. <laughs> I didn't even know I was earning it at that point. So then it was after a few years in that to move across the country into a different place and yeah. transition again back to church. It's just been, oh, my, my life has been marked by ministry transition. And with Lisa and I, my wife, we... Um, we have a number of ministers in our family, just like you. There's ministers on both sides, and it it spreads out across the country. And so you hear the stories, and you have the friendships and the connections, and you know what's going on because you've been there, and you've heard it, and, and you have family there. And it doesn't always go well. Yeah. It doesn't always go well. So I wanted to write to help in the situation mm -hmm. so i reached out to a number of ministers and asked them a list of questions did a survey from that survey i sat down and began to pull my own thoughts into it pour my own thoughts into it and pull their thoughts in and work through it and develop this book so there are there are parts of it that deal with the legal side of it and okay. and i reached out to an attorney who wrote a chapter in the book about the legal side of transition that oftentimes we do not consider. And That's then, something people don't really consider. And yeah. then, the, then I reached out to a, uh, a CPA, an accountant, and I had them write a chapter in the book from their perspective on the financial end and all and what needs to be considered in a transition. So this is not just my feelings about transition. This is from several ministers who I... And I, I've interviewed, I surveyed, I reached out, and then compiled all of this together in my words yeah. and from my perspective. But um, there, there are a couple of things I think maybe would help, and at least for someone that's listening or watching, uh, tuned in here, if we do not succeed in this, the only other option is failure. Oh, that's so sobering. <laughs> and... And this is the church of the living God. Yeah. This is a mandate. This is a man. This isn't, well, I'm no longer friends with them mm -mm. or, or uh -huh. I lost that job. I'll, I'll pivot and go into some, mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. other. No, this is, this is, this is, has eternity attached if to it. If truth endures to all generations, it is incumbent upon us. That we get this right. Yeah. At least to the best of our ability. And we either plan for this or we'll be forced to deal with this mm. one way or the I'll other. I'll take option one. Yes. You know, yeah. one of the things that strikes me as you're talking is I had an older minister contact me and say, brother Urshan, 
thank you for how you're handling uh, your circumstances. And it com- was very complimentary of Bishop Godair. And he said, you're helping to set a template for others. And this, these were his words. This is an older man who's been through many, many, many uh, life experiences, seen a lot of stuff. He said, as a people, I can't say that we have always done transition right. Yeah. We've, we've done a, we've done a, a less than stellar job in some cases of, of doing this. So this is critical. It would be nice if we could just open the Bible and there was a template. Yeah. You know, this is, <laughs> the, the, here's the five things, check these off and you get her. It's not there. Yeah. So, um, managing this truth is an enormous responsibility. Two things. One, John, he said it, we quote it, often can, can we often go to it, I must decrease mm. that he might increase. Yes. Well, in one sense, that's the way an exiting pastor has to look at this. Yeah. And that, in the book, it, it, we talk about this, it's harder, many times it's harder for a minister to decrease. It's harder for him to decrease than it is for him to die. Wow, that's a big statement. Because when you decrease, you are, responsibility is going away, influence is going away, recognition is going away, mm. oftentimes appreciation is going away Mm -hmm. but for that following individual it is necessary to decrease yeah for the ministry of jesus to go forward john had to he had to accept this so that's one thing that that's important but and and that's challenging but on the other side of that is the incoming minister and and where he is and the importance to remember, to remember all that the previous minister has done. And, and I just wrote a few things down that that I'll move through quickly and we can talk about it if you'd like, but God has already given a vision and a direction for that local assembly. And for a minister to come in and assume that God by their actions and by their decisions to assume that God has never spoken there before Hmm. is a death sentence for them. Yeah. Um, the, the congregation is going in a direction. Yeah. And if we're expecting an exiting minister to decrease, then an incoming minister cannot come in and not honor the past. Oh my. Yeah. And honor what God has and is, and will continue to do there. It's in the culture of that church. It's in the fiber of that church. Jos- uh, uh, Joshua's success was Moses' is imperative. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, Solomon's temple was David's vision. That's so good. Um, Jesus' sacrifice was the disciples' mandate. Yes. And it just keeps going on. Going on. You, you can't change it all, throw everything away, assume there's a new, a new direction, a new vision. And so an incoming minister would serve themselves well to spend time talking about where the church has been, where the church is, and what were the thoughts for the future. Because if they do not then they can sidetrack the church spending four or five years trying to figure out the direction the church was going yep. by just not having a conversation. That's exactly it. And continuing to build on the, the foundation and the vision that was there. So it's, uh, it's on both sides. Wouldn't it have been foolish for Joshua to get to Mount Nebo? Moses goes into Nebo and the Lord takes Moses and then Joshua to say, all right, now I'm the boss here. Now exactly. nothing else existed before me. Right. You, <laughs> wouldn't wouldn't that not be have insane? Been, you wouldn't be here. But oftentimes 
that's what happens. Boy, it does. A simple conversation can save you hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yeah, and lots of people's oh, lives. Oh, you come in, and because in your heart you've always wanted to build a building or you wanted to add to or you wanted to be a part of a construction process, mm. but the, the, the uh, building that you were in has already been remodeled 10 times, Yeah, and the next step is not to continue to remodel there. The next step is relocation. Yeah. Yeah. But instead, when you don't know that, you put money back into something that was already, already done. done. Yeah. It's just the practical things. So much, yeah. It, it, but, you know, the next step may be we're stepping out by faith yeah. in a massive way. And that youth or that stamina of the, the young mm -hmm. to address or attack that big feet mountain. Yep. I mean, one reason Saul wasn't out in the battlefield was because he was older than David. Yeah. David was young. Yeah. He was ready to attack. Saul had giants in his past. <clears throat> Saul had v things in his past. And yes, we could talk about a lot of other things, but when you're young, you're ready for war. Mm -hmm. You're you're ready for some other things. Yeah. That maybe age and life and circumstances has caused us now to say, I don't know if I can do that. You know, there's a there's a dynamic in transition with David and Saul. Obviously, is not a good yeah, transition. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And there's a moment where we see we see that. And I've seen I, I I've never looked at it in the in the con in the context of transition per se. Mm -hmm. But now that you're saying this, this this highlights it in my mind. It's when the handmaidens come out and they're singing. Saul has slain his thousands. David has slain his ten thousands. And and Saul immediately assumes well. They're ascribing thousands to me and ten thousands to him, and I'm I'm being put down. And you can see that influence moving towards David and away from Saul, and Saul yes. feels it. Now, if I am in a godly mindset, I know that's supposed to happen. Yes. This is not enjoyable to my flesh. That's the key. Yeah. Well, so watch this. There's another principle that that thousand ten thousand thing got me because I, I said, where have I seen that? And the Bible says that one would put a thousand to flight, two would put 10,000 to flight. Now, look at Saul as he's looking at this from a carnal perspective, mm -hmm. uh, from a self perspective. Oh, he's putting David over me. I'm losing. I I've got to attack David. Right. Versus if I'm in the Holy Ghost, then what they're saying then is, they're not saying David's better than Saul. They're saying Saul has done great things, but what could Saul and David do together? Together. What to advance to, the kingdom. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And and that's it. It's the godly mindset. The godly when mindset. When we realize this is not our kingdom, this is his kingdom. Yeah. We're just players in that, that he sets up and tears down and moves and adjusts and, at his will. Yeah. And when we ever forget that, then this becomes my church, mm. my city, my people. Yeah. My, when really this this is all his it's all his we're just stewards in this and realizing that what god is doing is setting the church up for advancement and to see build build it because that was my vision yes do it support it don't tear it down and yeah. and and so i'm excited about where you are where this church is mm -hmm. what god is doing at this time and we have we've had many discussions through the process and um i think healthy transitions come down to one thing and and that one thing is the character of the individuals when you when you cannot find in the scripture step by step by step how to get this done mm -hmm. then the character of those involved must dictate how the conversations go yeah how the decisions play out yeah it's the character and i think when it doesn't happen that way it points to the character of one or both parties wow wow that's that's my take that's a it. powerful statement you know character is it's the measure of a man and when you don't have a road map then you have to go into your internal roadmap and Absolutely. let the spirit of God guide you yes. and the fruit of the spirit. Yes. Um, 
John, the Bible says, no greater prophet born of a woman under that old covenant than John. Right. And even John, he, here he's in a prison, man. He's yes. going to be beheaded. His life is ending. It's coming to an and end. He's a human, you know, and he starts questioning, hey, all right, am I, I mean, what am I, chop Is it supposed here? to play out like this? <laughs> am I hamburger? What is right. That? <laughs> really? <laughs> and Jesus takes the time to say, there's no greater prophet. Right. And right. he, he, he gives great honor. I mean, heaps right. the highest. We're talking about Moses and right. Elijah and fiery chariots. Yes. And, yes. Red, and he, J- Jesus, God I lo- himself. I, I love the message that he sent back to him. Yeah. He said, tell him what's happening. Tell him what's happening. Tell him what's happening. Because there's nothing that will encourage a previously previous generation, previous pastor than yeah. knowing what's if happening. their heart is in the right place, if yeah. their character is the way, what's happening. Yeah. That this is moving forward. This yeah. is growing. The things you prayed about, the investments that you made, yep. they're coming to fruition. Praise God. Boy, what a statement. That's oh, so man. good. <laughs> it, it's, it's amazing. But um, if people are interested, they can go to my website, uh, robertmitchell2.com. The books are there. There's also a, uh, a new course just yeah, you, so you put some accompanying literature here. Yes, along with the second book. Mm-hmm. So I would highly recommend that to ministers. Mm-hmm. I don't know that people who are not in full-time ministry would gain much or enjoy the course in and of itself, but the course for missionaries, evangelists, pastors, retiring pastors, incoming pastors, there's an online course there that they can work through that's a that's a companion to the book. Wonderful. And also opportunities for coaching online, mm-hmm. uh, in-person coaching, whatever it may be, they can they can find. So you've got some supplemental um, opportunities where you will uh, help preachers, help ministers as they are navigating their way through this yes. process. Yes. And that's we have we have over the last few years been involved in that several times and are involved in it right now with churches and with pastors and there are testimonies there well i've got a testimony right here okay. in durham north carolina you have been a great help to us here well, thank you. <laughs> thank and you. i can testify that that the things brother mitchell's talking about they, it is it is very real he um, has a lot of great information for people and it will bless your church your local assembly well i appreciate that and if they're interested there's a place where they could book a discovery call mm-hmm. free if you're interested, you say five years from now, a few years from now, or we're in the middle of it, or we just came through it and I need to talk to someone about it. Yep. Will this help? Who should I look for? Mm-hmm. Is there an attorney? Is there uh, a CPA? Is there someone that you would recommend? I'll be glad to help in any way that I can. I do not provide legal advice or any of that type, but um, I can point you in the right direction. And if they're interested as a minister and they want to go reach out. I am available, but I think you guys are doing a wonderful job. And it's a, uh, it's a privilege to have been a part of that over the last few years. Well, it is a great blessing. It's uh, such an honor to follow a man of your father-in-law stature. And it's not easy. Um, you know, we, we grew up in the shadow of N.A. Urshan, which was like under Mount Rushmore. And so we got kind of used to the pressure cooker a oh, little wow. bit and grace under pressure becomes, if you don't do it, you just get squashed like a bug. Yes. And so coming to Durham, I, one preacher said, you know, you kind of want a guy to come in and mess things up before <laughs> you come in because right, <laughs> right. Brother Godair is like this monolith right. and he's just bus ministry, evangelism. I mean, how do you get any better than that? I remember some of our conversations and and I don't think that this would be to uh telling but <laughs> early on you you ask me the question well who does that and who who oversees that and who's a part of that and who leads that and i would There's say one answer to all that <laughs> my father-in-law my father-in-law my father-in-law he was everything <laughs> oh man yeah he was he was omnipresent. <laughs> oh my goodness what a great man well he and then the proof's in the pudding yes and we're it is incumbent upon us to continue that great legacy and not just brother go but sister go Yes. Sister oh, Mickey go Yes. I yes. mean, she was such a force. Yes, she was. And 
for good and for the great greatness of God's kingdom. We don't honor the previous generation. I read this one time. We don't honor the previous generation just maintaining what they did or doing what they did. We honor them by building upon what they did yeah. and taking what they did into the the present day and the future as they would have no doubt done themselves had age permitted or the call yeah. of God had permitted. They would have done the very same thing. So it's not honoring them just to hold on. No. It honors them to build upon. Well, you know, it's anachronistic to to try to just hang on. You're 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 literally on a moving escalator. Yes. And you're either moving forward or you're going back. Right. That's what it is. Your father in law was on the radio Oh my goodness. Back in the seventies. Yes. Yes. Seventies and eighties. Yes he was. Well we don't really do that anymore, but we right. do this. This. This and, and so there's things that you add to and things that you right. move forward with, but but what a what a privilege it is to 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 fight for what's right and to move forward into the future. It's an honor having you here. Oh, it's great to be here. I think we could talk all day. We could. We could do it all day long. I know you got a flight you got to catch, and we're we're going to be praying for the work in Denver. Thank you. And for this project you've got going on, I know there's a lot of people that are interested in this, and we're just going to do everything we can to help you and support it. Someone recently told me that um, there are, and I won't give the specific number, just over a thousand. I'll say over a thousand, more than thousand, fifteen hundred churches in the apostolic world yeah within the u.s yeah who are facing transition mm. Mm. right now right now right now and and a lot of that has to do with retirement not not just uh moving to another pastor right but retirement that, just age just age aging out what are you going to do yeah. what plan do you have in place this is the church of the living god get on the same page with him because there's a boy in in the field somewhere mm. that he already has his eye on yeah but if you're consumed with your own life and world and where you are wow. you'll miss and and we're facing that so if we want this revival that we are experiencing to be sustained then this is something we cannot avoid yeah what are you preparing for failure or success what a critical message well wow. thank you for your burden oh absolutely it's a needed a needed voice in this hour and thank you for being with us today on it's, Biblos. it's an honor um you're, you're getting ahead of the tsunami of of transition dynamics that are coming down the pike I believe that, and I believe it's a God-ordained thing. Yeah, I believe that. It, it isn't something that I just decided. Honestly, I have notes on uh, <clears throat> these devices that we carry around now. Yeah. And one of those notes is just filled with uh, book ideas and thoughts. Yeah. And I've been putting them there for years. But somehow in all of that, this, this is what I felt compelled to a few years back to address. Yeah. And here we are. Well, praise God for it. Well, thank you for being with us. Honor. We'll be praying for you guys. Thank you. And we'll, we will likewise be praying for you. And those of you watching this, go to robertmitchell2.com. Check it out. Get the information. If you're going through transition, if you're dealing with some life circumstances and wondering how best to navigate it from an apostolic perspective, I know it'll be a blessing to you. I hope you've enjoyed this session. And until next time, I pray that God bless you, God keep you, and God cause his face to shine upon you.